Hi, I'm Emma Delee. And I'm Carson Jones. In 2007, my Uncle Josh decided to climb Mount Everest. He was always an adventurer. And you know, he climbed mountains a lot. That was his hobby. So he decided he wanted to tackle the big one. At an altitude of about 26,000 feet, he had a rare oxygen mask failure, which led to his death. My Uncle Josh meant a lot to me, and I want to dedicate this project to his memory. After I figured this out about everybody who has died, including Uncle Josh on the mountain, I, we figured that the best idea we could have for this project was Mount Everest. Not only is it a dangerous place, but lots of people have died just trying to climb it. It's the tallest mountain at 29,029 feet. More than 300 people have died and even more undocumented. It's the border of Ch Nepal and Tibet and is 60 million years old. Once we decided on Mount Everest, we figured digging into the mountain would be our best bet due to the steepness of the mountain. We got a lot of inspiration from Canyon de Chelly National Monument. That is a monument where Native Americans dug into the side of a mountain for shelter. The only difference between ours and the Native American site is ours will be enclosed. We also had to worry about water. We couldn't just melt water from the top of the mountain. So we're going to pump water in from the Imja River, which is a tributary from the Dud Kosi River. Once you pur purify the water, it's going to be safe to drink and bathe in. Once we figured out water, the next step was air, of course. I mean, we breathe it every day. So air was a big problem in the mountain, and it's the cause of most deaths when you go up there. Not only the air, but the pressure at that altitude is very dangerous on you. You could die from haste and aims, which is different altitude diseases that causes a lot of deaths. So once we figured out the problem was air, I did a little research, and at that altitude, the pressure is a PSIA of five. Now, a PSIA means pressure per square inch absolute. Basically, it's just the amount of pressure up there, and that's what most of the time causes disease. And that's when I figured out, once we change that pressure, we'll have clean air, and we won't have to worry about most of our problems. So I did some more research. And the city we decided to work our way up to was Denver, because it has a pressure per square inch of 12. Now, that's really low for a city, but we figured if normal people can live there all the time, why can't we? So we then decided we needed a machine to bring that PSIA from 5 to 12. We went to the pressurization machines. Now, I got a lot of this from a person who works with air conditioning, um, specifically Johnson Controls. So once we figured out what we needed, I figured we probably need the machines that the planes will use which is the pressurization swing absorption and a pressurization fan, which is basically what an airplane uses, but 10 times bigger. And once we put it in, it will use the air from the outside and change it into air we can breathe. As you can see here, it comes in from this side, gets compressed, pressurized, and then blown into the facility. This is what's on planes. We figured we could use the same technique. We then had to think about food. So we decided we're gonna have a working garden and ranch. We want to grow vegetables being tomatoes, carrots, potatoes. We also needed to grow fruits, including grapes, blueberries, and strawberries. We did a lot of research and we found that we would need, we couldn't just rely on light from a small window. So we decided we would use LED lights. LED lights, are light that uses an electric current that runs through a semiconductor. The electric current couldn't run through just a pure silicon crystal, but you add another material, let's say phosphorus. The electrical current will then run through the silicon and it will produce light. LEDs were discovered with a project from NASA where they were trying to find which unnatural light would best grow healthy edible food. We then decided on which animals we'd use. We decided on the cow and the tar goat. Both produce milk and have an abundance of meat when slaughtered. We then researched more of the tar. The tar is actually one of the few animals that lives on Mount Everest. It lives at an altitude of 16,500 feet. 
once we figured all this out, we figured we needed a little more research. So we went and visited LSU's Agriculture College. So while we were there, we got to see a lot of cool things, including where the college students do hands-on projects. While we looked around at these, some of these projects, we found one that really uh, surprised us. They grew a lettuce head out of nothing but a tire and water. They got the lettuce to grow off of the tire, and it was really cool and compact. So we figured we could use innovative ideas like these on our mountain to save space and still get a plentiful amount of food. After that, we did a little more research on some plants that grow there, like blueberries and strawberries. They grow th that there. And once we looked at these, we decided that they would be best in our place too. Finally, we went and got to visit the goats, which was really fun. We got to um, learn about different types, types of them, and that's when we really went into thought about our target. And finally, we went to the dairy making place. So there they bottled milk and made yogurt and stuff like that. And I thought this was really cool. We got to see what machines pasteurized it and what machines bottled them up. And we decided that we would use the bottling machine. Now the bottling machine seems pretty simple to use on a mountain because all you have to have is basically gravity and a little electricity. You put it on the conveyor belt and it spins around underneath the nozzles that hold the milk. When it pushes down on it, then milk comes out and fills up the bottle. A similar machine is put on the other side to put a cap on top of the, water, the milk bottle. We figured this would be a simple and easy way to get milk up to our mountain and bottle it. We are so glad we got to go to the college and are so thankful we got to have that experience. And then our second problem was energy. Now energy is gonna be everywhere in Mount Everest. It's gonna be in the water pumps that we use to pump up our water, the LED lights that grow our food, and the pressurizing machine that, you know, delivers our air. So we figured we were going to need a lot of it. So first we decided for energy we were going to use solar panels, which seemed pretty obvious because at that height there's no clouds, so we'll get a lot of sun. And then we decided to use some wind turbines, but we'd put them farther down the mountain where the wind speed is higher. Finally, we decided to use kinetic energy plates which is this new invention that uses the kinetic energy in your step to create power. But then we realized that pressurization machine runs on oils and gases, which we could convert to energy, but we would like to have a backup. That's when we decided to use biomass. Biomass is animal and plant waste that you can turn into fuel. So we'll basically use all of the plant parts that we don't use in our food and put up into a fuel to have a backup for our pressurization. We then had to think about stabilization and insulation. Insulation-wise, we did a lot of research and we found that a product I've worked with before, D30, was a great insulator. We want to line all of our walls with D30. We found that D30 was such a good insulator that we would only need regular heats, heaters such as those found in a school to heat the whole complex to 75 degrees. Then, we really had to worry about stabilization because we're borrowing into a mountain and we have the whole top of the mountain on top of us. So, we found we would need the walls lined with steel connecting to a central beam all 40 inches thick. We then, had to, we then realized we would have to build the roof at a type of pyramid uh, shape to stagger the weight so it wouldn't all be on one central beam. So after we did this, please go ahead and after we did this, it was pretty clear we could go ahead and start with our facility. So we decided to research on some websites. After a while of research, we decided SketchUp would be our best idea for the layout. And once we got the layout done, we really wanted to do more details on each room, or some of them. So we decided to do Room Sketcher. And we also threw a layout in from Google Docs along the way. So we, without further ado, The, the Climb, climb resort. resort. So here's our layout we made on SketchUp. As you can see, these are the two doorways that will be locked at all times. You can only open one at a time when you're coming in, so we can keep the air in. Yes. Then you can see, go to the next one. Yeah. Then you can see we have a kitchen, an, the entry and supply room, the tech room, the bedrooms and bathrooms, the observation room, 
the ranch and garden, a lounge, a working cafeteria and dining room, and a recreational room. We also decided to have a window. Yes, we did a lot of research trying to find which window would be best for the ranch and the garden. We decided that metallic glass would be best. We found that metallic glass is not only great to see through, but it's one of the strongest materials on earth. So it could withstand an ice storm or winds. And the tech room will hold our pumps and our pressurization and any generators we plan on needing. After we figured out the layout, we decided to do some more detail in each room. This is the bedroom. So as you can see here, there's a bathroom, a bedroom, a little office area, living room, and kitchen. We decided since you're gonna be up in the mountain, this will basically be your second home up here. So we wanted to make you as comfortable as possible. Yes, you see we got a nice marble bathroom, yeah. We also have TV in every room, trying to make it as luxurious as possible. And after we decided that, we moved on to the rec room. The rec room was my personal favorite. We have a 50 yard football field for football practices and just general use, such as soccer. You could run on it. We also have two major pools here on the bottom. The two pools are pretty large and would allow for relays, swimming, and just general exercise. And then the top, those are meant to be machines, but we couldn't find one. So these are anywhere from treadmills to ellipticals to bench presses, because while you're up in the mountain, it's probably best to keep your strength. After that, we moved on to the lounge. The lounge. It's gonna be a working tavern and bar. We're gonna have multiple tables out here. We'll also have the bar along with about 12 bar stools. We also have a small stage. Small stage can be any types of entertainment. Maybe we'll have a special guest since it's a nice resort. Each table represents five tables and we will have some karaoke nights. <laughs> so after we figured out the layout and all the science behind it, it was pretty clear that we had finished our project. Well, this has been an exciting project, but we didn't talk about everything. Our workers in our project are gonna be Sherpas. Sherpas are the local people uh, around Mount Everest. They're known for guiding people up the mountain and really knowing the terrain. The Sherpas will be our guides to uh, guide people up the mountain. They'll also help work our things. We wanted to add a cultural flair to our project. So if anybody actually wants to walk up the mountain, you got a choice. We would like to give thanks to all of these websites we have. This, I'm not gonna say each one, but this one has helped, uh, helped me learn more about pressurization, which is really important to us. And these are just some more Google searches that I had to do to really get the project together. SketchUp, I just wanna say, was an amazing website to use. SketchUp not only allowed us to build our whole facility, but it allowed us to build exactly the way we wanted to. So we didn't have to make any exceptions. Also, Room Sketcher gave us a pretty much exact layout of how we would want our resort, if actually built. We are so glad we, had, we got to have this experience. Thank you, Miss Hall. We've really enjoyed it this year, and we hope, we hope that you continue to do this with the students to come. Thank you. Goodbye. Next up, we have Brayden Savage and Lily Buckman. Brayden has a total of one win on Fortnite, and Lily is currently in Townsend Theater. Sadly, both of them like Hamilton, but I hope you enjoy the speech.
who lives in a pineapple under the sea. Well, now you can too with Atlantis, Atlantis the, the sequel. sequel. Hi, I'm Lily Buckman. And I'm Braden Savage. So, for just a second, close your eyes and imagine. The world is overpopulated, it's too crowded, too much stuff, not enough space. You think there's nowhere left to go? Well, yes, there is. Let me tell you where. Our underwater habitat, Atlantis, the sequel. You may open your eyes. So, there are a lot of things that humans need to survive, and these are called humans' basic needs or necessities. Some of these are food, shelter, breathable air, purified water, and entertainment. To get breathable air, of which we have none of under the sea, we will, we will have a garden filled with many oxygen-rich plants. Some of the trees we have found are pine, oak, Douglas fir, common horse chestnut, and many more. We can also pump air from the surface if it's an emergency, and we'll add a chemical to the air called sodasorb, which removes carbon dioxide. To grow our plants, we will grow them hydroponically, which is a method of growing plants without soil and using mineral and nutrient solutions in a water solvent. So, to get purified water, since there's water all around us, it's not purified yet. So we would need to take the seawater, run it through a purification system, and then pipe it in through tubes so that people can drink it. We're gonna give more credit to SpongeBob here. We kind of took inspiration from Sandy's dome to purify our water, kind of like, almost like a water lock. But we didn't find exactly that. What we found was a 0.1 micron filter, which we got a tip from somebody to use. He said it's very good at filtering out uh, micro microorganisms and bacteria. We will dedicate buildings to um, purifying water in which we'll have a lab to test the water to make sure it's good to drink. So, since all humans need to eat to survive, or else they won't survive, some options whenever you're at the bottom of the sea would be fruits and vegetables that could be grown in gardens, um, some, canned, some canned food that would have to, it would have to be non-perishable so it wouldn't rot away, and it could be sold in, so, in stores, and also raw seafood. Sushi, anyone? For our shelter, we will construct it on land and then submerge it so as not to ruin it. We will also put it near the surface, no more than 15 meters down, for pressure and sunlight purposes. It will be set up in pod and dome shapes because those, those are the shapes that withstand pressure best. It will be pressurized and there will be a concrete base to anchor the pod. It will be made mostly out of steel and thick plexiglass and there will be a tube to the surface to, uh, in case there's an emergency and you need to evacuate. So. Um, in our model, there is, a, there is a main dome surrounded by two other smaller domes. And so for the main dome, um, there is an elevator that you take to go into it. And then whenever you get inside, you can see stuff such as a garden, parks, playgrounds, um, areas like to monitor to make sure that the air quality is good, and treatment plants for the sewage and water. Um, and it will supply air and electricity to all the smaller pods, and it will be connected to them by tubes. So, in this picture, it's an above view of the um, main dome, and it has the elevator that goes down. It's kind of blurry, but um, it, there's like plants and stuff, and that's a person. And then behind the elevator, there would be like bent and trees and stuff. And this is a better view because this is whenever the fish tank wasn't over it. So you can see the person, there's two other people up there standing by a bench with trees and plants. And this is an example of the hydroponics that we could use to grow plants. Um, and this is like a side view showing, wait, wait, I can't tell what this picture, oh, it's showing the umbilical cord that will go out and it will be connected to um, this box, which is in the back, and that box supplies electricity and air um, to go into the main dome. The smaller pods, can, there can be um, an, um, at most eight pods connected to a main dome, and in those um, smaller pods, there can be a max, approximate maximum of two to four people 
in the smaller domes, it's basically like a house. Um, there will be bedrooms, living rooms, bathrooms. The rooms will be divided by panels or partitions. This is a look at the tubes connecting the domes. The top one that is white is, is for the air to be able to go from dome to dome to make sure it's just not keeping air in. And the blue dome and the blue tube is um, the walkway for people to go from to, to from dome to dome. This is um, showing one of the rooms is divided by a panel closer up, but the panels can be moved if you want to get your home. This is a better look at the panel at the room divided by a panel. This is a close up of the body Oh, okay. That's the second room. It's not provided by a panel. So, so it will show you what it would look like if you open this door. And in it, there is a sleeper sofa that can fold out to a bed. And then this is an example of some of the beautiful sea life you can see on the trip. So, along with all of this stuff that humans need to survive, there's something that humans are used to having and would rather have than this out. Some of these are electricity, plumbing, and cleanliness. To get electricity, you have solar panels on top. And then you also have a generator powered by a strike and a stationary device for things that you want, like TVs or laptops. And then there will be battery operated device and also wind, uh, water turbines. So, since humans are used to having plumbing by now, and would rather keep it, take more plumbing on whenever you're at the bottom of the ocean, you can treat all the waste and then release it to the environment, or you can send it to um, a place in Maine Dome where it will be turned into fertilizer, or you can send it to a different place in Maine Dome where it can be sent off and treated there. For entertainment, like I said, uh, watch the sea life and there will be a big area that's netted off so harmful species can't get to you and endangered and you can't get to endangered species and where you can land just fish and they'll also be able to survive and then the site so since, since all but few adults and rarely few children like cleaning to, for cleanliness, to get rid of um, garbage and stuff, you can send it to a main dome where it sits up and it can be sent to junkyards or um, be recycled, depending on whether you like recycling or not, which I do. And you can have a facility in the main dome where trash is brought and stored utilities. So for clothes, it can be washed by hands, um, like in tubs or sinks. And then you can use portable vacuums that can have rechargeable batteries. I mean, you wouldn't actually need them plugged into the wall and just have the electricity plugged into it because we don't need to have the electricity at the bottom of the ocean. And for dishes, you can wash the liquid. So for our timeline, we got our um, our first dome that we Building the actual 3D model and finding furniture that was tiny enough to fit in. Science had to work together. And figuring out how we would get all of this stuff to go under. Same girl, same. Oh. For the cost, we got a free aquarium donated by my stepmom because my stepbrother has my stepmom. But they usually range from about $100 to $200. $80 for the pot and the stuff to go in them. 
$20 for class of students and $40 for measure services. Although research shows it costs an million dollars to actually build an underwater These are our sources. And this is our 22 presentation. I'm Billy. And I'm Brady. Thank you. It's an area um, near a volcano that has magma running through it. The magma inside is about 700 degrees Celsius and 1300, 1200 degrees Celsius, which is around 1300 degrees Fahrenheit to 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the walls are made of uh, an alloy of uh, stainless steel, chrome, nickel, iron, copper, co cobalt, molybdenum, tungsten, and titanium, which will uh, withstand the uh, heat of magma. And there will be about a foot of fiberglass in insulation, and, um, and the walls will be made of like, plastic material. Now, to keep the, uh, the inside cool, considering the magnet outside is around 2,000 degrees, um, we'll need a lot of air conditioners. Um, uh, the way an air conditioner works is uh, it has the, the red dots represent a liquid. Um, it has a, a, a pretty low uh, uh, boiling point. Uh, that, that right there is a... Uh, it, uh, it boils water, and then it sends through that tube. As it evaporates, it gets cooler, which cools down the coil. And uh, they pass air blowing through the coil uh, into the uh, into the uh, area you want to cool. And then it uh, sends the uh, gas back into the gas compressor right there, and it uh, compresses it back into a liquid. Now, to cool down uh, the area, calculating for 2,200 degrees, you would need 214 standard units, but uh, there you could probably uh, make a larger scale version that probably about twice as powerful, and it would take about 107, which is really double what you need. But um, 
in case of like breakdowns or repairs. Uh, just a buffer. Now, ultraviolet lamps. Uh, they would be good for animals that uh, you'd have for food, but they're bad for people because um, you, need ultra, uh, you need lamps that produce, produce ultraviolet B light. And ultra, ultraviolet B radiation has, uh, is associated with sunburn and skin cancer. So not really a good idea to have them on 24-7. But uh, the animals I mentioned earlier, we all have chickens and rabbits. Don't report me to PETA, but we're eating the rabbits. Um, and the chickens, and uh, we'll collect eggs from the chickens because vitamin D, uh, our good, our good, uh, egg yolks are a good source of vitamin D, and there's no sunlight underground, so. But, um, and you'll, and the rabbits, they're small, they're easy to hold. Uh, oh yeah, rabbits are, um, they don't really get along, but um, to, you have to pair them but the rabbits will be uh, will come into this facility like pre, uh, already paired. Uh, farming, I'll have uh, hanging gardens. Uh, and, uh, it's like boxes on the wall that have plants inside of them just to conserve space. And then uh, throughout the floor, there will be, uh, that's, there will be uh, little crop plots for um, wheat, oats, uh, and uh, barley. Now, preventing insanity, you need entertainment because without it, you will go insane. Um, there will be things like movies uh, played on the on here and projected on the wall. Um, there will be games also projected and uh, like board games and video games. Uh, there will be paintings on the green uh, on the green um, uh, screens because. Um, Uh, the, um, it, it'll be a screen, and it'll like flip between paintings, and then uh, you will also you can also listen to music. Um, for the bedrooms, it's just going to be pretty small, just two uh, two bunk beds, and uh, sleep schedule is going to be kind of messed up because underground humans can adjust to a 36-hour sleep schedule, so um, you're not going to uh, you're going to you're, you're, you're not going to be spending as much time. In the bedroom, uh, and there will be a kitchen, just uh, standard, a stove, a microwave, and a uh, fridge, and cabinets for uh, dishes and cutlery. Uh, for a bathroom, there's just going to be a cut off, but um, there's just going to be a shower, a toilet, and a, and a sink. For the toilet, I'm using um, one of like um, the toilets that squirts water at you, but um because we don't really have a, a unending supply of toilet paper and it's cleaner. Uh, I had a closing ready. Thank you for your time. I'm Larry Mitchell and my project is Volcano Living. Volcano Living is an exotic resort, not a lifestyle. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> this is what my model looks like. You can see that I have structures holding up each bubble, which will all be connected by a road. Each structure is 200 feet in the air, so that if there is an eruption with my volcano, which is, in Mount, which is Mount Etna in Italy, it will not touch the civilization. My biggest bubble, which is in the middle of the flank of the volcano, is the city, where there will be health, maintenance, and shopping centers and restaurants for you to visit during your vacation. Each bubble on the side will be where you will live or stay for the certain amount of time. For the smaller homes, which will be on the lower levels of each one, there will be two bedrooms, one full bathroom, a half bath, your kitchen with your pantry and your kitchen necessities, your living room, which will also have a flat screen TV and other living room activities. 
and the medium homes, which will be a little bit more expensive, but about the same for larger families, there will be four bedrooms, two full baths, a half bath, and there will also obviously be your kitchen, your pantry, and then your living room. And for the larger homes, which are for very big families or just for more expensive stays, you'll have five bedrooms, six full bathrooms, no half baths, your kitchen, which will have more expensive kitchen necessities, and your pantry, and then your living room, which will have an HD flat screen TV, an Xbox, and then other living room activities. For the bubbles, there will be 75% concrete, which is heat retardant, so that there, if there is an explosion on the volcano, it won't affect you as badly as if it was just a regular material. For the other 25%, it's going to be near ceram glass, which can hold up to about 2,000 degrees, which will be good in case there is a little bit bigger of an eruption to where it will touch the top of our cells. There will also be insulation around the 75% of the cement so that there will be no heat entering our cells. It will stay the same temperature just in case it does touch. And also inside of the homes, there will be insulation so that you won't have any extra heat coming in from the sunlight or anything, and there will also be air conditioning so that you can make it warmer in your home or cooler. Now, if there was an eruption, we don't want you all to die in your vacation. So we're gonna have, there's gonna be escorts on each side of the volcano, which will be three highways, which will all be three ways, so that we can escort you out of the situation 14 miles away to where you will be staying until you can go back home. Now for, for this, whenever we get you to your um, resort, where you'll be staying, we will give you food and you'll be staying kind of like whenever there was the flood. It will be beds all around, there will be food supplies for you, and then most likely if it was a drill or something, we'll take you back and then you'll be able to get your supplies. Now for food, at the bottom of each side of the volcano, we're going to have smaller cells that won't be as visible as the other ones, and each one for the 75% that will be cement will be filled with pre um, taken in soil and then on top will be sod that will be laid on top so that we can have crops put in and inside we'll have food like vegetables, we'll have fruit and then also we'll have animals such as cows and chickens so that you'll have natural food that will be inside of the habitat and you'll also have drinks for you that will also be inside of the habitat. Now for air filtering and water for the top where the neoceram glasses we're going to have these vents that are going to be at the top that will be open from the air because since it's still on earth air will still be able to get in so we'll have the air filter through and we are going to filter it since there's probably going to be smoke coming in and since there's going to be openings in the top rain will still be able to get in and still be able to water our crops and we'll be able to filter the water and put it into our water towers for us to filter and for us to put into the tubes and take to each hotel for you to drink your fresh water. Now for more in depth um, on our cities, we're going to have, like I said, the shopping centers where you'll get like your artifacts and everything from the hotel. But you'll also from that shopping center be able to leave the hotel and go explore around the volcano, such as you'll be able to walk around and look at it from a farther view in Italy, since you are going to be still on earth. Also in the hotels, each house will have a pool so that you'll be able to enjoy that. And then in the restaurants, we'll have obviously some that will be viewed into the volcano on screens and everything. So more about my volcano. My volcano, like I said, was Mount Etna from Italy. It has stratovolcanic lava, which is from 1,762 degrees Fahrenheit up until 3,782 degrees, depending on the severity of the eruption. The last time that it erupted was in 2014 in March, and it didn't it wasn't as severe to where it touched civilization, but it was enough to where they can still consider the volcano active. 
Now, whenever I was looking at these measurements, I did notice that if that would have happened with my resort being around the volcano, we probably would have had to make everybody leave. But since it wasn't as severe, it wouldn't have touched any of my bubbles and it wouldn't have affected anybody in a way to where they would have been harmed. Now for the structures that will be holding up our bubbles, each structure will be a mixture between neoceram glass, cement, and then fire retardant steel, so that we will have all of those factors to where if there is a eruption, it's not going to melt and then everybody will just fall onto the volcano. Another Dylan Armstrong, he likes to play football outside of school. He can turn his foot backwards and according to his fellow classmates in this whole class, he, sarcasm is the second language. So give it up for Dylan Armstrong. Mm. Morning, everyone. I'm Dylan Armstrong. For those of y'all who don't know me, I'm an eighth grader in Miss Hull's gifted class, and it's my third year doing this dreaded project. I want y'all to all close y'all's eyes for me for a second and imagine this. We finally go to World War III. North Korea sends over those nukes they've been talking about for forever, and America's left in ruins. Y'all can open y'all's eyes now. So when America's left in ruins, you know what's not? Antarctica. So that's where I chose to do my project. However, I didn't exactly start off the year doing Antarctica. I started off this year working on making Mars hospitable. And to do this, I was partnered with Raiden Bragg. After we did our proposals and a few weeks of research, I decided that I kind of just wanted to work alone this year because I felt I work a lot more efficiently that way. So I told Raiden how I felt and we went our separate ways. This is when I decided to do Antarctica. And I'm not gonna lie, I did Antarctica because I knew there were research centers there and it seemed pretty easy. So I got to research right away and I would now like to share some of my findings with you. I knew Antarctica was commonly associated with some of the animals that lived there. These animals include penguins, walruses, seals, a bird called a snow patrol, and some breeds of dogs are able to survive the harsh environment. I decided to look into it and see if these animals had anything in common with humans. These animals are able to survive in Antarctica because of their inner body temperatures. The inner body temperatures of animals in Antarctica ranges anywhere from 95 to 107 degrees, which actually works out quite well because the average inner body temperature of a human is around 98 degrees. These animals are also endothermic. For those of you who don't know, endothermic means that an animal relies on itself to generate its own body heat. Humans are also one of the few species that are endothermic. I knew that one animal in particular that was associated with Antarctica was the penguin. Penguins are able to survive in Antarctica because of their size and their body fat percentage. Penguins weigh 5.5 to 66 pounds on average. Uh, the average human weighs approximately 154 pounds. Penguins have a layer of body fat that makes, about, that makes up about 30% of their body weight. And humans layer of body fat makes up about 24% of their body weight. This means that humans give off less body heat than penguins do related to their surface area. It's kind of hard to explain using the shapes of humans and the shapes of penguins. So I decided to use a model I got off of coolantarctica.com using cubes. If you picture this cube as the penguin and this cube as the human, this cube is slightly bigger than this one. The volume of this cube is one cubic centimeter because the volume for a cube is length times width times height. And one times one times one equals one. The surface area for this cube is six centimeters squared because surface area is just the number of faces times the area of each face. And the area of a square is length times width. And since there are six faces on a cube, it's one times one times six. So six. This means that for every one cubic centimeter of volume, there are six centimeters of surface area to lose body heat from on the penguin. If you input the same reasoning on this cube, you come out with 27 cubic centimeters as the volume and 54 centimeters squared as the surface area. Since 54 divided by 27 equals two, this means that for every one centimeter of one cubic centimeter of volume, there are two centimeters of surface area to lose body heat from. And since two is smaller than six, we lose less body heat than penguins. Makes enough sense. So since we have these similarities with animals, this means that we could survive in Antarctica's 
freezing climate under the right circumstances. So I decided to look into this freezing climate. I knew that Antarctica was commonly associated with its cold temperatures. The yearly temperatures in Antarctica normally range from negative 40-ish to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The yearly highs in Antarctica are around 60 degrees, and these are a very rare occurrence. And on the rare chance that they do occur, they only last for a very brief amount of time. The highest temperature to ever be recorded in Antarctica was 63.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you think the cold temperatures are bad, it gets even worse. There's extremely high wind speeds in Antarctica too. The highest wind speed ever recorded there was 199 miles per hour. But I knew that even with these harsh conditions, they had permanent standing research facilities in Antarctica. Now at this point you may be thinking, if there are permanent standing research facilities, doesn't that mean people can live there? Well, these research facilities aren't self-sufficient, and the project was to make a self-sufficient habitat. So I decided to look into these research facilities and, just, and try to base my model off of one of them. While looking, I found one in particular that caught my eye. The Bharati Research Center is a research center in Antarctica. It is made entirely out of shipping containers. 134 shipping containers were used to build the 2,700 square foot facility. The facility is made up of three stories. These three stories include a first story, which is dedicated to research, a second story, which serves as a living quarters, and the third story, which serves as a lounge area. I plan to design my habitat the same way, a giant apartment complex, if you will. My habitat would have three stories also. I designed my habitat using SketchUp.com. For those of you who don't already know from other people's projects, SketchUp is a 3D digital design website. It is used for a wide range of drawing variety that includes architectural, landscape, video game, and even more. This is what my habitat would look like from the outside. My habitat would be built to house about 40 people and would have three stories. The first story would include a kitchen. My kitchen would include a refrigerator, a stove, an oven, a microwave, and a table that seats about four. There would be about five of these kitchens. Since there are 40 people living in the habitat, this means that there would be enough room for 20 people to all eat at the same time. So there would be two shifts for every meal, one for half the people and the other for the other half. The next room on my first floor is the laundry room. My laundry room would have six pairs of washers and dryers as shown here. There would be three laundry rooms, which would make up 18 pairs of washers and dryers, so about half the people could do their laundry at once. The final room on my first floor is the indoor garden. There would, be go there would each be a separate garden for each individual type of plant. This is an example of what one of the gardens would look like. My second story would be a living quarters. The living quarters would have 20 8 by 12 bedrooms that would look something like this. These bedrooms would have a set of bunk beds for two people to sleep in, a bookshelf, which would serve as a dresser, and a desk for reading, writing, whatever you feel like doing at the time. Each bedroom would be connected to an eight foot by five foot bathroom. These bathrooms would include a sink, which would have some cabinets and drawers, a toilet represented here, because I just couldn't figure out how to design one. And there would also be a bathtub, shown here. My third, final, and favorite floor would be the lounge area. My lounge area would include a gym. As you can see here, the gym would include a treadmill, some dumbbells, which are represented by these tube things, and a weight bench represented here. The next room on my top floor would be the library. My library would have over 100 books to be checked out two or three at a time by the people living in my habitat. There would also be two desks for reading, writing, research, whatever you felt like. My next room in my third store is the TV room. The TV room would have a 32 inch flat screen which would be hooked up to a DVD player since there's no way we're getting cable service in Antarctica. There would also be a couch and a bookshelf full of movies for the DVD player. Now my final and personal favorite room is the rec room. My rec room would look something like the one upstairs for those of y'all that have been in it. It would include a foosball table, an air hockey table, and a ping pong table. Now one problem that I faced when designing my habitat was that there are long, dark, cold winters in Antarctica, which take, about, which take up about six months of the year. My habitat would be powered off of solar panels. Half of these solar panels would be used during the six summer months to power the habitat. The other half would store up energy and save it for the winter. Now, 
Along with this freezing climate in Antarctica, I would need a way to insulate my habitat so we don't all freeze to death. So I did some research and found an insulation called polyisocyanurate. That took me a long time to learn to say. This is the best insulator that I could find on the market. It has an R value of 5.6 to 7.7. .7. For those of you who don't know, R value is just simply a term that refers to the thermal resistance level of an insulator. So when I refer to R value, because I will again later in the speech, think of R as resistance. However, it being the best on the market makes it quite expensive. It costs $22 for a sheet that's four feet by eight feet and just one inch thick. Now, along with the perfect habitat, we would need to make sure the people living there could stay alive. And to do this, we would need food. Hold up, wrong button. There it is. Okay, so we would get plants using a method of growing called hydroponics. This is how plants are currently being grown in the South Pole. Hydroponics is a method of growing plants in liquid, sand, or gravel with added nutrients, but with no soil. It has been shown that plants can grow rather large using this method of growing. I would grow my plants using a ceiling that, was, that has artificial sunlight instead of normal light bulbs like the rest of the rooms will have. Now along with plants, we will also need meat for protein. The meat would come from the animals living there, which I listed earlier. Over time, we would learn how to grill, roast, clean, and cook these animals perfectly to adapt them over time. We would also have a breeding facility so we make sure we don't accidentally endanger these animals and get PETA on our case. Now along with food, we would also need water. Since Antarctica is ice, there's water right under the surface. We would simply just need to run pipes underground from the facility, the but since the water is salt water, it would run through a filtration system into the pipes. You may be thinking, if it's under ice, wouldn't that water just freeze the pipes? It would. So I'd have to insulate the pipes. To do this, I would use a material called aerogel. Aerogel has an R value about 3.7. I told y'all I'd say that again. Now, along with food, water, and habitat, we'd also need clothing. Doing some research, I discovered that it's best to layer clothing rather than just wear one bulky layer like we do here when it gets cold. It is best to layer your clothing in four different layers. The first layer would be a layer to wick away moisture. This Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jackson Pemberton. And I'm Hannah Burns. And this is our 20T project. We, we definitely spent 20% of the time on this. Yeah, totally. For our project, we chose Titan, the largest moon of Saturn. This is because that after colonizing Mars, NASA wants to send its priorities to Titan. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, there. the only real guidelines Ms. Hole gave us were that we needed to meet the five basic essentials for life. Oxygen, water, shelter, food, and entertainment. You will die in three minutes without oxygen, three days without water, three weeks without shelter or food, and one month without entertainment. Without entertainment, you'll go crazy and somehow kill yourself. Alright, this is what Titan looks like. And that is the surface of Titan. You can see Saturn in the distance there. Titan's really interesting, because although it's a moon, it's technically big enough to be a planet. But because it, it orbits Saturn, it will forever be just a moon. And it's covered in all kinds of interesting things, like poisonous chemicals. Radiation. And some explosive surprise we'll tell you about later. Oh, yeah. Um. So one of the main essentials that we already need to have is water, which is already provided because certain places of Titan, including Seldon and Fredman, oh, to are covered with the layer of water ice. That's Seldon Fredman right there, which like circled in Microsoft Paint in like 30 seconds. We can harvest this ice and melt it and then reuse it several times over so we only have to harvest every once in a while. And that's not the only thing Seldom Fretton gives us. We will probably be living next to the strait that Seldom Fretton, like I just said. And it goes at very high speeds because of Saturn's gravitational force between 23 and 46 miles per hour at least four times a day. So we'll create an entire dam across this entire straight to give us a lot of energy several times during the day and that will be our main source of electricity. We will also we will also have batteries to to as a backup plan. 
Also, for power, we'll also be using windmills. Because the winds in the upper atmosphere of Titan can reach up to 200 miles per hour, we have three very large windmills up there to, har to harvest all of that. Also, there have been signs of radioactive decay on Titan, meaning that there is some type of radioactive material, probably uranium, inside of Titan, so we could use that in a little power plant if we needed to. Mm -hmm. Another thing is the algae bioreactor. In goes biomass or any kind of food and out comes energy. Basically use the algae to break down the food into energy for us. Next is oxygen. For oxygen, we have five algae tubes, each one with 20 square feet of surface area on the inside. Five times 20 is 100, and 100 square feet of surface area of algae is enough for the average, if enough for 100 people, which is how many people will have. Yeah, it's definitely a generous amount. Also, if you didn't know, which you probably don't, algae is some of the most efficient oxygen creators on Earth, making about 70% of the oxygen that we breathe. Now, for food, being the generous space landlords that we are, we have an entire square kilometer dedicated as a greenhouse. And I know this may rustle a few jimmies, but um, our entire colony is going to be vegan. It isn't really worth it to bring live animals to space, and we can, and we can get the, the protein that meat provides from other sources, like soy. Yeah, soy, beans, coffee, sugar cane, any of those uh, foods that are used in just commodities will also be very important. Special niche foods like bananas for potassium and lentils for iron will also be provided within this greenhouse. So, basically... All right, so our main area from an, we have basically we are going to have you'll see this later on but we're going to have a dome we're going to have an elevator and that's going to lead down to our main area which is a central plaza Ooh, this is called the third place and you probably have no idea what a third place is so here's a quick rundown basically like half a century ago a dude named ray oldenburg realized that humans spend like all of our time in three different places home work and a third place the third place is generally characterized by being social accessible and equal oh, so that first place the home like this is going to be divided and in, divided into two 1,000 square foot barracks one for males one for females and the second place the work depends on who you are you could be a scientist who works in the lab an explorer who ventures across the vast arctic temperatures or a farmer who works in the greenhouse Oh, by the way, talking about vast Arctic temperatures, the surface area of Titan is negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. So just so you know that. The currency system for these jobs will be the U.S. dollar. Next, as we talked about, is radiation. The entire, the entire surface, everything on uh, Titan is covered in radio ra radiation. And it just looked like we were about to be able to live there. Yeah. Anyway, so because of this, we're going to use line the outside of our colony with lead because lead is highly resistant to radiation. Wow, another problem solved. But here's another one. How can we walk outside without dying to the extreme cold? Anyway, be well, that way, first we've got to insulate the inside of our base, which as I said, as it says right there, think of these things, but gigantic with super mega heaters. These will take a lot of energy, but from our damn windmill, algae bioreactor, nuclear power um, combination from earlier, we'll have a surplus of energy to use on them. Also, for our insulation, we will have a wood wall, a ton of cotton and then another wood wall probably multiple feet thick and that should insulate our colony pretty nicely mm -hmm. oh, I'm I want to shut up. up hello 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 okay all right everybody we're gonna get this started back up oh, next we got Owen Cooper Owen Cooper fun fact is writing his own book with main character Chase Borealis and I'm eager to see how it turns out. Let's give it up for Owen. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. So, I'd like to 
ask you a question. What would all of you do if mass ethnic cleansing started happening? Or maybe several terrorist attacks on some of the greatest groups of people in the world? Political assassination, if you will. We all need a place to escape to. Some will go to other planets. Some, the people who may think a bit more inward, will think of a place just a short drive away if we could go straight up. The stratosphere. Hi, I'm Owen Cooper. And I am the person behind Stratosphere Survival. <laughs> Starring Owen Cooper. <laughs> so, what is Stratosphere Survival? Stratosphere Survival is the name of the project Miss Hole assigned to all of us to make an inhospitable environment hospitable. And I, obviously, judging from the name, chose the stratosphere. <laughs> so, what is the stratosphere? Because I've been throwing that word around a whole lot. <laughs> The stratosphere, it's a whole lot of things. But let's just go with the basics. Hi, my name is Bailey Lindsay, and I'm sure by now you all know what the project is and what it's about and all of that. Well, I chose to make my project on top of the ocean. I chose this area because it was one of the most simple solutions that you could get for this problem. Lots of people try to find the most difficult solutions, 
when you can just get a simple one, like on the ocean instead of trying to go to another planet. I decided to name my city or world on the water Oceanopolis. Oceanopolis will be built on an oil rig platform that can move up and down based on high, how high or low the tide is. If the tide is high, then the model will, or the platform will move up so the whole area doesn't flood. Now, okay, so Oceanopolis will be uh, located off the west coast of Mexico where you will find the no North Equatorial Current. It is one of the strongest currents in the Pacific Ocean, but not the fastest. Now, you may be wondering what would happen if there were a hurricane or tsunami or just a big storm that came. Well, we have two solutions to this problem. The first solution, if it is just a minor storm, is borosilicate glass will come up from over or will extend from the sides of Oceanopolis, creating a dome or a bubble over Oceanopolis. Once the dome is secure, Oceanopolis will be fully submerged underwater. Before I go any further, you're probably wondering, what is borosilicate glass? Well, if you've ever seen a submarine, you will notice that there is a glass viewing area either on the front or on the top. That is borosilicate glass. The way it works is the further you go underwater, the more pressure you'll find. The more pressure you have, the stronger the glass becomes. Now, if there is a very severe storm, then like a hurricane that's coming that will last several days or even a tsunami, then the legs will retract on the platform, a system of propellers will engage, and the platform will move to a storm-free location. Once it has reached its new location, the legs will extend and it will be anchored to the ground. Then once the meteorologists have reported that everything is clear and back to normal, the legs will retract and move back to its original location where it will once again, the legs will extend and be grounded to its original location. Now, you may be wondering, how am I going to breathe underwater? Well, that is why when, whenever you are on top of the ocean, there will be large tanks that will store oxygen. Whenever the dome starts to form over Oceanopolis, the air will start to be let out of the tanks. Once the dome is fully formed, it will have plenty of pressure, plenty of pressure and plenty of oxygen in the dome so everyone has enough to breathe and there will, will be excess. So whenever you go underwater, there will be plenty of oxygen and you won't have to worry about, you won't have to worry about not having enough because you'll only be under there for about 10 to 15 minutes. And whenever you are on top of the ocean, you won't have to worry about not having enough oxygen because, well, you're on top of the ocean. Now, for water. Since you're on top of the ocean, you will have water that will be pumped and from the ocean, okay, for fresh water, that will be pumped in from the ocean onto Oceanopolis. Once the water has been on Oceanopolis, it will go through a system of filters before being brought back to where the refrigerators or wherever water is going to be distributed. There will also be water stored in tanks in case you have to go under the ocean for a hurricane. Next, there is, they might have to wiggle the mouse to press the play button. Oceanopolis platform. 
Second, this will represent Oceanopolis hydraulic lift system. In the event of high or low tide, the legs can extend or retract to prevent slipping. In the event of a storm or severe weather, the legs can retract and a system of propellers will engage to relocate Oceanopolis to a storm-free area. to guide you through the creation of Oceanopolis. To begin, I had to lay out a system of transportation because that is the first step of city development. For safe transportation and development, we must include roadways and street signs. A few examples would be a hospital sign, a stop sign that will be placed right before the crosswalk. We also have a children at play sign, and last but not least, your fire station sign. Second, I have various structures that must be present for a successful community. For example, we have a housing section that is ideal for any size family. The housing section will be complete with a farm and garden. The farm will consist of sheep, cattle, chickens, and pigs. Next, we have a church for worship, where anyone is welcome. Last but not least, we have a medical center. For sake of space, this model does not have all structures on display. However, a few of the structures that will be present are fire stations with firefighters, police stations with police personnel, schools with buses, there will also be a hospital with veterinarians, physicians, and dentists, there will be a post office with Male person, there will be maintenance personnel, meteorologists with media reporters, restaurants, entertainments, and chefs. For entertainment, we plan to have cheerleading events, soccer fields, theaters, swimming arenas dog parks, baseball fields, football fields, and libraries. There will also be a city transit, and we hope to see you there too. Hello everyone, I'm Gage Cartwright, and for my project I chose Venus. Imagine a world in which, say, a crazy epidemic has sweeped through our country, killing many, leaving only the strongest left. This would leave basically our country unlivable because it would probably still exist, so we must move somewhere else. I chose Venus because it has a very similar size and similar gravitational pull to Earth. Now,
in order to fix some of Venus's problems, we need to first fully understand it, such as the heat, pressure, and wind characteristics that make it dangerous to live on. To first deal with the pressure, and this can be dealt with through a few different things, such as location, as the colony will be located underground using the natural rock as a kind of protective layer, as well as strong geometric shape, like using a cylinder. Next problem I have to deal with is heat. Now, this is extremely dangerous, as the average temperature on Venus is 864 degrees Fahrenheit. That'll basically roast you alive. This can be dealt with through using high melting point materials such as titanium, tungsten, and graphene, though very little graphene as it's highly expensive, as well as using strong insulation, insulating materials like, fi like fiberglass and kale wool. You also have to deal with the acidic rain from the sulfuric, the sulfuric, oh crap. Like the sulfuric acid cloud, from the sulfuric acid clouds. Now these don't only, these don't only just create the rain, it also does trap the heat causing the temperature to increase. Now this can be, these, the acidic rain can be dealt with using high corrosion resistant materials such as chrome or certain stainless steel alloys. We also have to deal with human requirements such as oxygen, water, and food. Food can be dealt with through both using edible plants and animals. The water, will, the water will be acquired by using sulfuric acid and purifying it, as its chemical compound is H2SO4, meaning it has all the necessary parts in order to splice and make water molecules. The plants I'm planning on using are, there are two types of plants that I need, both oxygen and also things called nitrogen fixing plants that cause the soil to not become as worn out. These include soybeans, alfalfa, and peanuts. Now for oxygen, I chose the garden mum as it produces a large amount of oxygen and it, all, and it does not take up much space, as well as the peace lily as it grows best in shade and does not require much to grow, making it extremely hard to kill. Now, for the soil, this, is, this was a question I was asked. Where am I gonna get soil? The, the only way I could think of was either just bringing it with, with us to Venus or by trying to figure out what minerals are in our soil that we could basically create it in a lab. Now, electricity, I chose wind turbines as the average wind speed on Venus is higher than that of than that of Earth's, making it extremely efficient to use wind power. Now, for to deal with human and animal waste, I thought of using it as fertilizer, some as fertilizer, and other to be just taken care of by moving it to a different location on the planet, as anything else would be too dangerous to use. So for my final thoughts, this year's project was difficult and very challenging, yet extremely fun as we got to use our love of science to help splice with actual science and, I, and our own ideas to create our own little form of sci-fi, which I quite enjoy. So thank you, everyone.